going to do the woodshop introduction, but this is also for many of you a sort of a longer introduction to Make Haven. You did the tour, um, but we're going to go through like what badging is. We have a badge box up here and we'll show you what's going on. Um, in general, we're going to go over the badges, the badging process and what your badges are and what they do. We're going to talk about wood a lot. This is woodworking week. We're going to do two weeks of really just jumping into the woodshop. It's mostly what we're going to do. Uh, we'll talk about how to connect wood pieces, some good starter projects and like terminology that you'll want to use or be savvy to, and then like how you would square lumber. And then we're going to tell you to not do that um, because it turns out it's fun and very useful and you can get wood for cheap, but it's also tricky and maybe not the goal you want to go after as a starting project. So we're going to some sometimes in these classes, we go over conceptual big picture ideas. And then you can directly do those. And other times we've got good recommendations about what it takes to have like good successful starter events. Um, so this is gonna be one of those. I, I would guess that there'll be three of you that choose the square rough lumber and then the rest of you will do something else, which is fun. Go over some power tools and different types of tools this week. First up, uh, do you wanna explain the badging process, Kevin? We sadly do not have physical badges, but I think as soon as I learn the embroidery machine, I will make that my first project. Um, but a badge is what tells the system and everyone in the space, so that's kind of less important, that you are signed up to use a piece of equipment. Um, so a lot of the machines in the wood shop and the metal shop have a uh, power boxes such as this one that Corey is so helpfully holding up. Um, and there's a little box on the wall that you swipe your ID card on and then you hit the green button and the big green light comes on. Imagine it's glowing. And the power to the tool, it was on and it will do your bidding. Yeah, this is one that actually like, I'm in the middle of working on a team to try and get these to come to have the next iteration of. Um, and that's the active card reader. I don't know if it'll make a noise after it's today or not. There's a light. I see oh, a light. Yeah, there's some lights. There's things going on in there. There's a lot. I've been doing this for months. It hurts a little. Um, <laughs> but inside of here, basically, you'll have a card read and it lets you turn on the tool and off the tool. It's a power interrupter. So, like when you plug in the table saw, we plug it into the toolbox. So the toolbox can control like who's safe to use the tool. It's essentially so that we can have any hope of getting insurance for the space by not just letting anybody wander in and turn on all the tools. It's just enough gatekeeping. The badging process is just enough gatekeeping so that like insurance is happy. We have some reasonable hope that people are gonna be safe. It does the badging process I would say is good to get that sort of control. It's not necessarily gonna mean that you're an expert when you go through the badging process. And some of you might have, anybody have badges already? I know some of you have been numbered for a while. Cool. Yeah. Well, I got to see you in your yeah, my action badge. Yes. And I passed the thing for a couple. Sounds great. And an excellent point. So the badging process for different machines and tools, um, for some of them, you watch the video, you take a quiz, and that's it. You have a badge for most of the machines in the wood shop or the metal shop. Um, or you could hurt yourself, you actually. You could hurt yourself or hurt the machine if you yep, sure. don't really clearly know what you're doing. Um, then you will need to sign up with a facilitator and come in, and they will walk you through um, everything you need to know to not hurt yourself or the machine. And they can also help you with whatever specific project you are thinking about doing with that machine, um, which is another nifty part of badging. Uh -huh. One of the things about that, and we'll talk about this towards the end, is that you'll need to schedule a time with those people. So there's some logistics to work with that. We have listed in here what are all of the times this week, and then we'll also be trying to help. We'll be blocking off time so that you can have as much of a group badging experience as possible, which is actually pretty fun. Like if, if there's four or five people that want to get the lathe badge, it's kind of fun to all do it at once. We have a neat photo from last year's cohort. Everybody's standing around. I think you were doing the training. I think so. And, and everybody was doing it together. And it's kind of fun. Everybody just sort of pokes at the lathe and does a little bit. You get the process turn it off and on. And it's a, it's a lot less intimidating. And it's more fun when it's a group of people doing it. So it's a, it's a good thing. We'll be very active on Slack always. But while we're in these big badging weeks, the first four are, 
will be will be very clear and communicative about when those groups are them as well. So let's see. And then once you get a badge, you're free to 24-7, whatever you want, come in and turn it on, turn it off, do what you want with it. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah, there might be something fun that happens, uh, but it's good. So we are headed back to this. We're going to go through, now we've talked about badges, we're going to go through wood types and sort of some of the processes that it takes to do that. One of the things that we want to, that I want to set expectations is if you have any questions, your comments, your thoughts, ideas, this is a group conversation. It's different. Like I teach high school all the time. And that is, I'm very often the person in the room that knows the most chemistry, right? Um, whereas in here, there are people in the room who are by far much more of an expert than I am at all sorts of things. Like if I needed to make a sculpture, I would go to Julie for advice. Um, if I need to do woodworking, I'm going to ask Adam. It's different. And, and you all have experiences in your own lives where you may be much better at these things than we are. So there's going to be moments where if you are that expert, please correct us. Let us get better um, and feel free to contribute in that way. If you want to tell us after, because you don't want to talk to the group, that's also totally fine. Get that 100%. But finding ways that we can always improve each other, make this better, and like have a good conversation is really important. You're just talking about how you learned so much about metal jewelry making. Oh my God. Because of foundations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The She's now a facilitator, Ada Wilderman. She's going to be an architect. She's going to a Yale grad program for it. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, she made a whole bunch of jewelry and said, you should talk about soldering. I didn't know anything about soldering jewelry and learned a ton from her. The slides, when I look back at her years, I added in a bunch of electronic soldering on that spot. And I learned so much from her and other people about it. Uh, so there's tons of ways that we can help each other learn and grow. And this is more like a, a learning community. And, and certainly there's a class, like we have, we'll have a prepared thing every week. Um, mm -hmm. But if you've got something to contribute, please feel free. You're welcome and invited to. So. That said, let's talk about wood. Wood. Mm-hmm. Uh, does these smell like familiar places to you, Adam? They, they do. They do. Are these, I was wondering, are these like local? Oh, these are just the internet oh, photos. The internet. The internet photos, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they all look very same. Well, actually, Man. this one I think is in Brantford. Uh, yeah, I went and bought wood in Brantford. Okay. Yeah. For the, the yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Do you know the place in North Dakota? Uh I do you you the place in over by 12%. Oh it's on that little side. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is crazy. So there's longer, like construction yeah. lumber yard. They are a like a resale store. They have like a ton of furniture and yes. construction equipment. Yes, mm -hmm. no, you see from the tree. Um, maybe um, so, you, might but be you wouldn't close. notice it because okay. it looks like a warehouse. But they have this. They recruit like you know when like a like an apartment building is getting torn down. They just re they just reclaim like everything that's salvageable, and then they resell it. And they have just the guy took. I mentioned I worked at McCain and I was looking for something, and he took me in the back, and they just have just like an acre of reclaimed wood. Yeah. That was very very cool. What are they called? Talk about wood yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's this. The reason why this slide says buying wood is oddly technical is that when you walk into a place like this sawmill that we're hearing about, or you go to the Brandford sawmill, it's there, or you walk into Home Depot or Lowe's, the people there kind of expect you to know what you're asking for, and it's a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're just saying that out front because wood is something that everybody has a certain familiarity with. It makes a home feel homey for, in a lot of cases. And so it's something that's really great to know about, but don't uh, don't be surprised if you bump into somebody when you're like trying to buy your first prime piece of uh, maple at Lowe's or Home Depot. And they're like, well, what do you mean? You don't know what you want. Um, not that that's okay from them, um, but it takes a little bit to get onboarded. Like if you want to buy plywood, it turns out there's a whole, sh a whole row of plywood at Lowe's and Home Depot. There's sheathing and plywood and Baltic birch and then like cabinet grade and other types of grades. We're going to talk about those in a second, but there's all sorts of different ways to buy wood of various sizes and styles. And my sincere recommendation is start with free stuff. We have a huge, awesome scrap pile downstairs 
And if you are completely unaware of what to do, start with the free scrap that we have. Don't like put pressure on yourself to go spend $500 on wood out of the gate, which is a big wood purchase. Also, by the way, a lot of wood. that's a lot of wood. But um, don't use the free stuff that we've got just to play around with some of the tools, especially if it's your first time using them. Also, I have a workaround I use. If you're going and you don't know what you want, tell somebody there how you plan to use it and they will guide you. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you trying to do with it? It's sometimes easier. Oh, and if you're going to Lowe's or Home Depot, go during normal business hours. Mm -hmm. People there are much more knowledgeable during business hours. So don't go to the Home Depot and Hamburg. Their supply is garbage. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> that said, here's a general intro to wood materials. Um, these are the three classes. You feel like these are good classes to talk about? Yeah. We have hardwoods, plywood, and spruce pine fir. Um, we have a collection of hardwoods up here. We're going to pass these around. Uh, there you go. These are provided by our delightful Janice, <laughs> who is a middle school shop teacher. And can probably take us all to school with what we need to know on these things. All right, all right. All right, so some of us. And so these are different types of wood. There's labels, pass them around. These are all from an Appalachian wood supplier. Uh, and so it's got different things to take a look at. So as you're looking at wood, hardwoods, you want um hardwoods are what you're holding. These are solid pieces of wood, they come right out of the tree. It takes a lot of work to get them as square and as flat as they are there. Um, but those are those are what you're talking about when you're talking about hardwoods. A softwood is not a term that's often used, but those are spruce, pine, and fir. So the Christmas tree that you may have just tossed, those would fall into that camp. These woods are going to be hard to like stick your thumbnail into, the ones that we're passing around now. But the spruce, pine, and fir, if you hit it real hard with your hair nail, you can put it down. Right, or it's what houses are built out of because it's way lighter and it's way cheaper. Mm -hmm. Softwood grows very fast. We can actually grow soft spruce pine and fir faster than we use them around the country. What is this thing called? Yeah. Sorry. That is a purple heart. Purple heart. Yeah, the purple heart piece is really cool. Fancy one. That's the fancy one for sure. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we said five hundred dollars is a lot of wood. Unless you're buying something fancy. Unless you're buying something <laughs> fancy. Yeah. <laughs> They, there's a very wide range in price ranges for different wood species. That's true. Walnut is kind of it's a nice dark one, not twice as much as all the rest, but it's nice. Um, plywood is its own little category of wood products, sort of like American cheese is a cheese food. It's not. It's not a cheese. Uh, plywood is a really clever thing. Turns out plywood, you take a tree and then they do, you know, like, remember the pencil sharpeners from when you're a kid? Mm -hmm. You turn it, this little sliver comes off. They do that to a tree mm -hmm. and you get a thin, a thin layer of wood off the side of a tree to make plywood. You take those thin layers and they glue them up with their brains 90 degrees to each other. Specifically 90 degrees to each other because it is much, much stronger when those fibers are running in opposing directions. If you had a three quarter inch piece of plywood and a three quarter inch hardwood, you jump up and down on the plywood, it's not going anywhere. You jump up and down on the hardwood, and some of the species will crack under your weight. But a plywood never, never is going to do that. Very old houses have much thicker subfloors of hardwood for that reason. More modern houses have a three quarter inch plywood subfloor, so it doesn't need to be as thick. It's a little cheaper, no longer easier to manage. Quick question. Yeah. Doesn't uh, plywood and particle? Particle board is is like the scraps and left link. They just glue together. So particle board is all. If you ever seen a piece of wood, it's just like a bunch of loose ends that look like they're glued together. That's exactly what it is. It's like the spam of, of the wood world. Yeah. Hot dog of the wood world. Yeah. Scrap. Remember this from my like high school shop class. But is there a difference in like recycling wood that try to do plywood versus regular wood because of the glue in it? Um, That's a good question. The difference in like recycling or reclaiming wood. They just always ask, like, sort of things. We were done with wood and plywood and, like, stuff that was the other word you said versus regular wood. So there's a lot of interest. We're going to get to glue and how you hold things together right here. Turns out glue is one of the ways that you connect wood, and plywood is a great example for that. The wood glue, sometimes people think, like, glue, well, you're thinking about your school experience. Glue is sort of crappy, and some kid in the corner likes to eat it, and yeah. it's very strange. 
when you glue pieces of wood together, wood glue is stronger than the wood itself. So like on some of the tools in the tool, in the like the planer specifically, they'll say, take the clumps of wood glue off the surface because it'll hurt the tool cutting blades. The glue is stronger than the wood. If you glue two pieces of wood together and you break those pieces apart, it'll almost never break on the glue jar. Glue is a lot stronger. And so probably they were sorting and saying, we can burn and just like get rid of the solid wood. That's not a problem. The plywood with all that glue in it, you got to handle a little differently. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, Probably a little sort of like well, and that's probably more about the, the glue is plastic. Yeah. So when you're burning wood glue, you're burning plastic. Perfect. And a lot of times plywood, especially for construction, will be made with uh the wood will be treated with other chemicals that you don't really want to be burning. So you'll notice in the wood shop downstairs we have a firewood scrap bin that is specifically just for hardwoods. Uh, so that's also because you don't want to be burning the stuff that goes into making a lot of plywoods. Yep. That's true. Boards. Or um, treated wood. If you ever see wood that's like kind of green, they treat it with arsenic so bugs don't go into it and you don't want to burn that either. So like plywood, and it's very much lower than it was in the like pre, I'm going to go with, let's just say it was in the 60s, something somewhere in the 60s we realized that's too much arsenic and turned it down. Too much arsenic. Yep. Uh, and so you don't want to burn plywood or treated or treated lumber for outside um but softwood like spruce pine fir and hardwoods totally fine um there are lots of other ways other than glue that you can join things screws and nails are totally great nails and screws are things that you can learn you can really nerd out on if you want turns out that some of them are good at shearing strength and some of them are good at pulling strength like it's really hard to to snap a nail um sideways they bend in ways that make them really good at at fighting against a sideways force, whereas a screw will snap. They have different jobs. Screws hold things together sort of a long ways, and screws hold and nails hold things along from moving sideways. It's sort of weird. You can really go deep. How do you know what to use? Um, lots more experience than I've got. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Complex joinery. There's some really cool, some people really, really get into this style of joinery. There's a ton of really cool old school cultural places, but Famously, the Japanese tradition of joinery is really awesome. No, no not now. Um, this is a Twitter account, and Twitter is its own bag of worms right now. But in here, these are different. Somebody went through and animated like 500 different styles of Japanese joinery. So these are different ways that you can connect pieces of wood um, that have various reasons why you choose one or the other, but they're all traditional. These were all designed and done by people by hand. Look at that crazy one. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there's all sorts of ones that you might try, but this is something that woodworkers get really into. If you want to get very high in your craft, you're totally going to nerd out on this. However, this should not be anyone's week one activity, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, but like, there's some really cool ones in here as you keep digging through, looking for stuff to be inspired by or try. There's even, yeah, this is... Um, Somebody made a bed in that style. They're really, that's really good for making bed frames, actually. I think it's called a castle bed, is the style, because they sort of look like. Walkmate? Yeah, walkmate. Yeah, one of the facilitators. So there's some really cool things that you can do. There's all sorts of different styles of joinery like this to try. This one's really wild. That goes in there, and then these two little pins keep it from coming undone. That's in a lot of old New England homes as well to hold the like long joints that run across the ceilings of old buildings. They'd use this when the trees weren't tall enough. So those little pins just keep it from being able to slide back out. It's really helpful. But you could get good at that. These are often put together without wood glue because it was like a pre-plastics wood glue era. And then the last one is super glue. Super glue is great for so many things. Cyanacrylate. Um, and it happens in seconds, usually. You can even get a spray to activate super glue. If you have not thought about super glue since you were young enough to think about huffing it, which also is bad. Don't do that. Um, it is very, very helpful in the wood shop. It, it fixes quickly and it's stronger than you think. Let's see. So not as strong as wood glue. Yeah, wood glue is. Yeah, it's a good advanced trick. And you can use it. I mostly use it for a lot of times you get chips that pop off when you're cutting something and you can just glue the chip right back on as if nothing happened. Yeah, it's a great way to cover up 
woodworkers will often say that learning woodworking is about learning how to cover your mistakes. Mm -hmm. So that's why you learn about super glue to cover up some mistake that you made or to do something else. Um, it's not that a great woodworker is fantastic and sticks the landing every time, um, but that they learn how to cover those mistakes up. As you're doing that, you're going to want to start off with simpler projects. Um, and I was thinking about looking up a floating wine bowl, bottle holder. You want to explain any of these, Adam? I'm going to look up. So there is, we have a, oh, oh, like. I'll talk about that one in a second. Yeah. Um, so cutting boards are a great starter project. Um, you can start if you're starting with uh, S4S square four sides lumber. Um, you can just get on the table saw, cut it into strips, glue the strip together. That is a cutting board. Um, and it is super handy and will last you the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, charcuterie boards, uh, also cool. It's the same the difference. No, no. There's just, I don't. Can you use really. the same board for cutting on one side and serving on the other side? That's what you know that I, people do. I found the difference. I made a bunch of cutting boards for family, and then every one of my family members like this is too nice. It's, so they just serve cheese on it now. <laughs> so when you cut meat, the juice flows, and that's a cutting board. But should or the other ones for cheese? Yeah, no, they they totally can be. You can put a juice groove on either. People do that decoratively now. That works. Here's one of the floating wine bottle holders. Mm -hmm. This is a really cool trick to pull. Um, this is just a piece of wood with a hole and an angle cut at the bottom. It's a super fun, quick project that you can do. This is a great starter project. Like if you've never used a saw or the drill press before, this is really fun. You can do it in an afternoon. If you're pressed for time, this, is, this has a wow factor. That's also really fun to make. Um, and as a physics teacher, it's all about the center of balance of the thing. The center of balance of your wine bottle has to be over this little angle piece down here. Um, and so it's, you know, we can we can get as nerdy as you want with that. Um, but that's for a different time. Let's see. I have a question. Yeah. Can we use uh, tools in the wood shop to cut non-traditional material, like shells or yes. plastics? Uh, so you kind of credit. plastic, yes depending on the kind of plastic um other materials definitely case by case basis so no metal period is the wood shop rule on the whole shop a lot of that like the table saw you can cut small amounts of aluminum um but we ask that you do not because uh it's the wood shop <laughs> uh, plastic Generally, so acrylic, like for making picture frames, for example, it's super handy to just take a sheet of acrylic, cut it down to size on the table saw. That is something I've done a lot. Um, and other kinds of plastic you cut on the table saw typically would be the use case. Um, but other materials, it just depends. So I think you said you shell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that would probably need to be. Um, in the metal shop is more for so like you can uh grind i would imagine like a jewelry saw you might want for that yeah but um it's it's totally a thing like one piece that's tricky about cutting other materials in the wood shop is the table saw that we have is a saw stop which is awesome if you nick it you nick your finger with the table saw the table saw will destroy the blade in order to preserve your finger which is really cool. It's a safety mechanism. Um, at some point in the next couple of days, I'll send out a, a Jonathan Katz Moses YouTube video where they show that in slow motion. So you can like watch that happen. So you can feel very safe as it goes on. Um, but the but if you try to cut metal with that saw stop, it can't tell the difference between metal and a finger. It's just looking for conductivity. So like you have to do some things to get it to cut metal or plastic. So it doesn't fire that, which is like a $200. Oops. Um, which is totally fine. Like it's there to keep everybody safe. But if you didn't want to trip it and you weren't going to hurt yourself, you know, it's you got to be thoughtful about some of those things. I mean, I have a hunch that shell might be similar to like ceramic, where it's a lot about like getting the right drill bit because most drill bits like can't cut through ceramic. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've heard that shells are similar, to, like very. I can see that. So I was, I was, I was saying. You'd probably do that in the metal shop with uh, 
diamond cutter or a, an abrasive rather than a, a saw um because you when you're cutting something really brittle like that it's going to have it's going to chip out really easily so a saw will tend to cause it to break more than you want it to but <laughs> that I have specifically for putting drainage holes in ceramic pots. And I imagine that would probably be... Like a diamond bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would just like a power drill? Or do you yeah. Can you do that on a drill press? Both. Both. Totally fine. Yeah, it still takes forever. Um, yeah, I like my garage, like Sunday wine. <laughs> yeah, I think it was time. All right. Uh, other cool starters, picture frames. There's a cool framing jig downstairs. Jigs are really great to make stuff. Uh, they're helpful systems that we'll talk about more next week. Bowls and handles on the bowls and like stuff on the lathe is really fun. If you want to make a baseball bat or a drumstick, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the lathe is all about spinny wood. And so we'll talk about that in a second. A birdhouse is like the classic hardware store. Bring your eight-year-old in and we're going to do this on a Saturday to try and have you buy stuff. Example. But they are really fun. And, and like there's plenty of people that will appreciate a birdhouse. Or if you just want to go nuts on the joinery samples because you're already good at wood and like have been chuckling in your head about how close we are, uh, you could totally, I would love to see people make some fine joinery samples over the next couple of weeks. And simple boxes are good also. Um, we're gonna, now we're gonna talk a bit about the way that you describe wood. Um, do you have, you, here, let's see what this, do you wanna walk us through the three big names? Okay. Well, so we'll get to the straws in a second, but wood is, uh, a piece of wood like this that's been planed and uh, actually jointed maybe the edges haven't been jointed but we have so face grain is just the wide part of the board edge grain is the narrow edge of the board and then end grain is when you cut a board in half that's what you're looking at on the end um and the straw analogy is super handy because you can imagine a piece of wood as just a big bundle of straws. So like as a science teacher, it's pretty accurate. And like they're they're biologically a bunch of tubes to carry water up. They don't pump water, they use capillary action with tiny molecular straws to bring water from the ground up to the leaves, which is mind blowing. So next time you see a tree, just imagine Auxilian leaves with tiny drinking straws yeah. pulling the nutrients up from the earth. Um, but this analogy I find actually really helpful thinking about using wood because wood as a material, um, super, super, super strong that way. So if you take a bunch of, we could set. Uh, something very heavy. You could stand on this bundle, and as long as you were putting all the pressure straight down, yeah, it's not going anywhere. Um, but if you try to bend it, it's going to break very quickly. Um, and not actually going to no, it's fine. ruin these straws. But if you bend a bundle of straws, you'll be able to pretty easily uh, bend them all 90 degrees. I cannot do that with this piece of wood, but if this was a piece of soft wood that was slightly thinner, I could just bend it or break it over my knee. Um, You've probably all done that with sticks in the woods when you're a kid. Um, I did. I work a lot with high schoolers who build model airplanes and little bridges for science things, and those come in long, like hobby sticks of balsa wood. Those balsa wood sticks are actually really interesting building materials because, like. You know, it's easy to snap them, no problem. But most, if you like read scientific papers on this, usually a thin, like quarter inch dowel of balsa wood, if you attach it to the ceiling well enough, like I could hang. It's like shockingly strong, length, strong lengthwise, but it's it's they're snappable sideways. So these straws are great. Um, they won't slide long ways past each other, but they will separate. They can delaminate those layers. And especially on like heavily grained wood like this, if it's going to chip and break, it'll break off at the layers there. Sort of in the rings of the tree, they can separate from each other and sideways if you pull them like that. Um, I love this diagram over here because it shows the face grain and then the edge grain and then the end grain. These are two different types of cutting boards. 
if you thought, cool, I want to make a cutting board. It's a great thing. I've needed one for a few years and I'm going for it. An edge grain cutting board is the first style that you'll make. Although people will pay you about double online for an end grain cutting board. They're perceived as better quality because your knife, if you're using a knife on a cutting board, the knife will go down between the straws because all the straws are pointed up in an end grain cutting board. And so your knife sort of slides between them like that. If you're using an edge grain cutting board, you're cutting like against the straws or maybe through the straws, and it's not quite as good for the length of the, for the lifetime of the knife. Um, but the method to make an end grain cutting board, you have to make one of these and then basically cut it up and re-rotate it into this orientation. I'll send a digital, there's a really awesome online tool that'll help you understand that. We'll send that out this week also in the foundation's chat. So you'll get to see some cool resources. Um, another thing that's important to think about, you might hear words like quarter sawn or center cut or like uh, cathedral cut is sometimes a thing that you hear, flat sawn, riff sawn. These are different parts of the tree that they come out of, sort of like you might um, get a brisket or, a, a, you know, a other cuts of meat that I've already forgotten what they're all called, um, but they come from different parts of the animal in the same way there's names for wood that comes from different parts of the tree. The most liked is often this quarter sawn where it's sort of straight out, like a radially outward from the center of the tree, because um, it's often the strongest and the straightest grain. Some people really like what they look like in other orientations. So there's a lot of different ways to think about this. And if you want to make a table, and please, we'll advise you not to make a table, but if you wanted to, you have to think about your grain over a large object like this. You want to make sure that they're the curve of their grain flips for each board in a row. If you're making a table, it's a more complicated skill than you think it is at first glance. Cutting boards are great because they're small. You have the same problems as making like a four foot wide table because you have to think more about your grain in that large size surface. Wood actually will expand and contract over the course of a year. Those straws get a little bit bigger and they get a little smaller. In the winter, all your wooden furniture has contracted by about 3% inwards. And then it gets a little bit bigger in the summer because it takes on more moisture. Uh, the air conditioning or the, the heater that you use in the winter to stay warm pulls moisture out of the air, sucks it out of the wood furniture, and it all contracts. If you go into an old home and you look at the floor very carefully, if it was poorly installed, you might see cupping or bowing in the floorboards because if they're over moist in the summer, they'll turn into little cups, little bowls. And then in the, in the winter, they can go the exact other way because of moisture flow in and out of those wooden materials in your life which is bonkers. There's all these weird hidden things in the world. Okay, so let's say you've got wood. We're gonna talk about squaring it. This is a process. If you've already done some woodworking, like you feel comfortable with the saw, you've done some things, and a lot of people who show up here have, mm -hmm. squaring wood is a good way to go to the next level. If you're not, this is good conceptual information, but I would say, I think my advice, and maybe you can confirm or, or completely disagree with me, this is not for like a beginner beginner, but it's good to know what happened. Yeah, so you can you can get wood that is flat and square from the store. So we're gonna advise yeah. unless you really want to take this on this week and next week, um, you probably want to start with the stuff that's already flat and square from the store, or you can find a lot of scraps downstairs that'll somebody their offcuts from someone else's project where they went through all the the squaring themselves beforehand. Um, but this sort of is the diagram we're going to walk through. You can see it's just, I took a piece of wood texture, and this is a piece of it here. This is rift sawn, if you're curious, but there's the sort of rough texture on the outside. You can see the, the lighter color piece of perfectly square wood that's inside there. And so like Michelangelo chipping away at marble to make uh, the David, we're going we're gonna to do the same thing with this piece of wood. So you go through a whole series of steps to get a rough piece into a square piece. Usually you start off at the jointer, which is this big old thing in the shop downstairs. It's staying there forever. It's never coming out of the basement. Yeah. Um, do you have a preference? Would you like to do first edge or face joining, Adam? Face jointing generally comes first. Um, which is the bigger, flatter surface. Yeah. So well, if anyone wants to get the jointer badge, you will learn all about this, but you start Face jointing, get a flat face, and that's what Red Acres sits against the fence to get a flat edge that is 90 degrees precisely to that face. And of course, the board I grabbed 
doesn't actually have an edge joint to put quick up pretend. So like you start off and if you want a face joint, here's the cutting blade. It's a big spinning, whirling twirl of death. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes in here like this. You pass this board over this way and it just takes little bites off the bottom. And the outfeed table is a little tiny bit higher than the infeed table. So it takes off the rough stuff on the bottom as you pass it over, making this side just a little bit higher up and a little bit smoother. You might need to do that a couple of times for a piece of wood, but that would be face jointing. And you're registering it off this table surface here. Then, like Adam was saying, you turn it up and then you push the flat surface that you just made against that surface that's 90 degrees, and then you can get the edge jointed after. So first you take off the face, then you take off the edge, which you've already got from there. So would this be like a log or something, or just a random piece of wood? Okay. Would you use a log? Would you be doing this with like a log or? Just... So this process that we're talking about, these are boards that we're looking at. So rough sawn is a, you start with a log that is round, and then at the sawmill they'll cut it in boards, which are roughly square, rectangular in cross section, like that picture. Um, Wood also, we will not get into this at all, but wood is very wet when it's in a tree. It oh, needs to dry out, um, which there's a lot of different ways that that happens. But when you go to the store, you find stuff in the trap, it'll already be dry. But the drying process makes it very warped and rough. So this is how we turn it from that warped, rough, rough sawn lumber into useful square Wow. Here's a video of it coming off. This is a sawmill. So, like, if you put a tree, we don't have one of these tools here. Um, but like, if a tree falls down and you want to cut it into boards, you'll need a sawmill like this, and it's basically a giant bandsaw that you bring to the tree. You load the tree up onto the sawmill, and then you can cut off sections of it like this. They're never flat enough that you would want to make them your dining room table. Um, except for the, there's a few pottery barn has had a line of rough stone <laughs> tables. Most people would not want them to be your table because they're bumpy and, and not smooth. Um, and so this process is how you get a rough sawn board and jointing and planing and all that makes it go from this, which is going to have some roughness to the surface and turns it into something nice and smooth. Like you want to eat, uh, um, pause and back to us. You might want to square it just to make sure everything's like perfectly flat. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, so if you'll find pieces in the scrap downstairs that might have been sitting there for a long time, because wood moves over time and expands and contracts, you can actually have an off cut that somebody already did this whole process to. And it used to be square, flat, not warped, and now it's no longer square, no longer flat. Um, so, because wood like, is always changing. No, you're good. Is the planer just like more like refining that flat edge more so than a face jointer? <laughs> that is the the question to ask. And, I have, and Emma had a question too. I just for the planer and the joiner. Did you ever use these on plywood? No. no. Okay, so don't. Yeah, yeah, so you don't have to worry about it, which is great. Plywood is very convenient to use. Mm -hmm. People sometimes are cranky, they're, they poo poo plywood um, because they think it's not as fancy as a hardwood. Plywood is so useful. It's everywhere in modern construction and it you can make really cool stuff with it. If you really want to watch someone do cool things with plywood, go watch Michael Alm on YouTube who makes pattern plywood things. Uh, he's phenomenal and makes really cool, like, patterns with the layers and how they interlock yeah really good use like the quality of the videos are good but also the things that he makes are really cool and he's in the pacific northwest in seattle i think oh there you go a planer's job is not to make a thing straight it's to make the top match the bottom so if you have a flat bottom top will match perfectly but um we had a facilitator who was famous for banana in banana out so if your board that you put into the planer isn't super flat, the other side will match it perfectly, but it will also not be flat. <laughs> banana in, banana out. Um, if it's got a big curve, it's going to have a big curve on the top. Um, but if you joint it successfully, yeah, just like that. Banana. <laughs> uh, the, but the planer is really good at taking off a thin layer on the top if you know the bottom is good. 
Sometimes people will even use a sled with the planer. Jointers are traditionally very expensive tools. And so a home wood shop may get a planer before they get a joiner. So they'll take a rough piece of wood and put it on a sled that's flat like plywood in through the planer. There's, there's a lot of interesting tricks that woodworkers have built up over time to make accommodations with what you got. Uh, luckily, we have a very full wood shop downstairs. So, yeah. Can you explain what a sled is? Oh, yeah. It would just be like a sheet of plywood. If you have a, a board like this that's sort of meh, you take a, a sheet of plywood and set this on top of it. And then if, let's say I have one corner that's weirdly popping up. I would just jam a shim underneath it. So it's not wiggly. It's not going to wobble on me. Might even hot glue it to the to the sled, and the sled will ride flat on that metal surface, and the wobbly piece of wood will pass through it without wobbling or shaking because the sled is holding it steady. Yeah. Um, also, there's snipe, but that's if you're really getting into this. On your way in and out, there's a little extra bite that happens. Sometimes the board. Do you have you ever had a major snipe problem you had to deal with? This. So the picture is the joiner we have downstairs, or the planer we have downstairs, um, which we just got a few months ago. It is a beautiful machine, super capable. It has a bigger issue with snipe than our old one did. Um, and you will notice if you start to use it in the future, uh, it does have the the end the last like two or three inches of your board will often be very perceptibly uh more deeply cut than the rest of it it's it's a thing if you're getting if you're in the land of using the joiner and planer you'll think about it if you're not totally ignore what you said um the table saw this for me uh, this defines the wood shop. This tool, uh, I grew up in the Midwest and I don't think there were any rules. In the garage, there was a table saw. And as soon as I could turn it on, I was cutting stuff. So I'm very comfortable with a table saw, probably uh, un not in a healthy way, but the overly comfortable. But a table saw is really good for lining things up and making other sorts of cuts. So once you have a board where you've jointed the bottom, you've jointed one edge, and then you planed off the top. Instead of tipping this up on its side in the planer, you'll often ride that straight edge along this fence here. And that fence will hold this side straight, and then you'll cut off the other rough side on the table saw. So it's to get that last, the fourth edge of the board straight, you can do it here. Although the table saw has many, many, many other uses, um, and they're really the, I would say the heart of most wood shops is getting things in and around and through the table saw, right? Does that feel right? Definitely, yeah. So the table saw can do using a fence, jig, or sled. So another use for a sled, same idea um, as using a sled on the planer, but on a table saw, there's lots of different very specifically made sleds to, that are made to do certain kinds of cuts. So most commonly a cross cut. So cutting across the wood fibers instead of along the wood fibers. So when you're using a fence, um, you're usually doing a rip cut, which is along the wood fibers, but you can use a sled to do a cross cut and make multiple short pieces of wood. Um, and you can make them very precisely as angles if you need to glue something up in a, a round shape you can make different angles to fit together um yeah if there's a cut you need to do to a piece of wood you can probably do it on a table saw with a sled um there's hundreds and hundreds of sleds that people have imagined and built and designed to make weird cuts with a table saw because the table saw is a very old tool they're very easy to build actually so they've been around as a power tool well before there was electricity for them as a power tool. Steam-powered, belt-driven table saws were totally a thing back in the day. Uh, like the old sawmills in historical areas, they would be water-wheel-driven sawmills. Like there's tons of ways that we built uh, table saws like this. And there's many, many solutions on how to get this simple core tool to work really well. Um, these are different kinds of jigs and sleds. So the cross-cut sled here helps you cut across the grain. A spline jig is if you want to reinforce your corners. 
You can make custom sleds like in the moment. Um, Four Eyes Furniture is Four Eyes on YouTube is really good at using these a lot. They have a ton of good examples. Box joints, or if you want to make these little finger joints, this is a very traditional thing. We'll see again later on. Um, if you want to cut something while it's standing up, there's a vertical putting jig. These are safe ways to do something that would otherwise be really, really unsafe. You wouldn't want to hold a board upright. Um, but because you can register against both sides of a fence, you can do vertical cutting for sort of tall pieces on a table saw with plenty of safety. Um, this person's holding it with their hand. You could even clamp it if this makes you if this makes you a little nervous what they're doing with their fingers there. Um, but there's lots of ways to do it. And then here is uh, if you want to make picture frames. This is a really great sled for that sort of work. There's a, a few different versions of that. Um, and so there's sleds for very specific things and very general use cases. A cross cut sled is very helpful. There's one with an aluminum cross piece downstairs. That's the cross cut sled. It has the robot cut into it. And then there's a big M and an H. Those that's downstairs. That's the cross cut sled. You'll see it. It's metal and where there shouldn't be metal, but it's fine. We have we have an untupdated one that's a little bit smaller, but doesn't have metal where there shouldn't be metal. So. Okay, cool. That's great. Um, another tool, and this is if you can only learn one tool, I think I would recommend the bandsaw. You may change if you may want a different one, but the bandsaw is great. Um, this is an, another one that little me used far too early and far too much. Uh, but the bandsaw is really good at doing all sorts of things. These are bandsaw boxes that are a great beginner project because you can make them entirely on the bandsaw. You start off with a piece of wood like this one. And using basically just bandsaw cuts, you can, in a bunch of creative and interesting ways, there's plenty of YouTube videos that will show you exactly how to do it, and we can help you with that. Um, you use the bandsaw to make these fun curved cuts, and then you these are drawers that you're able to use from the wood that cuts free from what you started with. So there's some really cool ways to make little jewelry boxes, the way to hold like earrings and things like that. Ring, you know, Small objects are often good to be held by bandsaws bandsaw boxes, and then for resawing wood, which is I would have, when you have a board like this and you want it to be thinner, that's often a process called resawing. So if it's this thick and you want it to be half that thickness, you could go to the planer and do a, a million little passes, but then all of that wood that you remove is sawdust, so it's not useful anymore. If you want to instead turn this into two boards, you can use a bandsaw to cut it right down the middle. And so you'll just sort of press this through the bandsaw and it'll slowly make a cut down that way. And it's gonna be pretty slow, um, but you can make sort of long cuts that way, starting at an end grain and going all the way to the other end grain through a board. Um, yeah, so. How hard is it to get a straight line? Okay. How hard is it to get a straight line doing that? Um, if anyone's interested, uh, any of the facilitators can help you out with that. We have a couple different uh, you can use a fence on the bandsaw that lets you turn your board. So it's just registering at one point. And so you can just draw a line on the edge of your board and follow that line. Um, and in theory, if your saw fence is set up well, um, you should be able to just go right through because the bandsaw uh, because it's a band that is a saw, so it's flexible. Uh, it's going around a big wheel at the top and the bottom. Um, it has a lot of flex to it, so it'll want to follow the grain of the wood. Um, so that can be an issue for sawing in a straight line, but you can usually adjust the fence, and that will make it stay in a straight line. Um is there different like sides of the actual band for different types of cuts? All so would, for different yes. cuts, yeah. Any saw will cut differently depending on how many teeth it has and how far apart they are. Uh, so we'll talk about that more. Mm -hmm. um, but that's true on a table saw or a band saw or a hand saw. Is that something we would change or something that we would have like the... Oh, you can totally change it, yeah. Okay. The Typically a longer, like a thicker bandsaw blade, and we're talking like three quarters of an inch thick, they go straighter very often, and the real thin ones let you just tight curves for bandsaw boxes. What do you want? Each little for a while blade shows you how it's like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we and have still have to, feel free to ask me with your hand to ask the facilitator, like or just someone in the shop. Yeah. Right. Especially the yeah. workshop, we have a lot of like actual professionals and people who do woodworking for their job. Mm -hmm. and, like I've got I've looked at that people and I'm like, just hold my hand. <laughs> just, thank you. Yeah, yeah. always happy to do it. Yep. <laughs> Uh, all right, the chop saw. This is, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Adam nailed it right there. It's chopping across the grain. Um, this one you may have, and if you're going to have one of these in your garage because you do construction on your house, this is probably the one you bought to do the crown molding or the trim. And so this one lets you cut across the grain. It's very quick to use. It is big and scary and dangerous in that it's a large blade that you're moving around. However, it's always behind a guard and it can be used very safely with no worries at all. As you lower, it only opens to access the blade as you lower it down to make the cut. So it's not like it's out in the open and spinning around as a saw blade. Um, if you have, if you, there's other blades, other versions of this that are less safe. Pick a good one, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, but this also a sliding compound miter saw, sometimes called a chop saw, has the ability to tilt and twist. So it can move around in a lot of ways. So you can get big angled cuts. You can make turns. And when you're doing like trim in a house, and we don't have any trim in here really to speak of, um, but when you have like a corner for molding, you need to join and have the angles work really well. This saw is really good at making those angles repeatable, consistent. And so you can have joinery that, that really lines up really nicely. Um, totally safe. Keep your fingers out of the yellow zone. Is that Fair enough rule. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. true of any tool in the shop. If your fingers do not go into the cutting, whatever it is, mm -hmm. your fingers will be okay. Yep. Um, every tool has a slightly different method that you make sure that you are not putting your fingers in. But knowing where your fingers are is job one. Right. Absolutely. Just in general. Yeah. Just in general. It's a good life rule, really. Know where your fingers are. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. This uh, on a table saw, it's usually a little red thing. On the band saw, it's a little more all over the place. You can get your hands pretty close safely on a band saw. Um, I would say that's a pretty safe tool, also. Mm -hmm. This one, as long as you're out of the yellow zone, you're totally gold. Um, other stationary tools. This is a fun one the scroll saw. It's like a, in a lot of ways, it's like a toy sized band saw. You can make really fun, really detailed stuff with a scroll saw. It's just basically shaking a saw blade up and down through whatever you're trying to cut. Um, I have let sixth graders use this unattended before, and I'm a still a public school teacher. <laughs> so this is a very, very safe one. Usually to show them that it was safe on a blade that only cuts on the front, I would turn it on and put my hand on the back and say, don't ever do this. Um, but it's very, very safe. Um, it's as safe as a power tool could be, is this one. It's a lot of fun to play with too. If you meet Darcy, who's like a, You'll meet Darcy. He's making a skull headphone holder right now. Um, he's great. He's a pro at the scroll saw. I can show you whatever you want. He makes signs and things with it. Where is it? It's back by the past the tool sharpener um, to the left of the Gerber. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Behind the door. Behind the door. Yeah. Yep. What do you have? A scroll? Sorry, what's your experiencing saw and scroll saw? Uh, scroll saw stationary, a jigsaw you bring to the workpiece. So the big one that. Apologies, so you don't want to run No, you. It's like this. Yeah, no, it's probably a. They're cousins. Okay. Yeah, yeah. really close cousins. A jig size, basically a handheld scroll saw. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the panel saw, if you're working with plywood, this is really great. They have one of these at Lowe's and Home Depot that they will not let me use. <laughs> um, but if you want to cut a piece of plywood in half, we have one of those. And there's plywood you can buy in the shop downstairs. So if you wanted to make a big plywood thing, you can bring your plywood panel in and cut it down on this. It's much safer mm -hmm. to cut a large sheet of plywood on the panel saw than to try and balance it on the table saw when it's still four feet by eight feet. This is much, much safer. And it's really good for that. Although you can't really get precision cuts. Like if you need it to be an inch and one eighth, don't, you're not going to do that on that saw. Mm -hmm. um, but if you need to take something that's four feet wide and turn it into two feet wide, awesome. It's really good for that. I'll also say the panel saw is awesome because there's a ton of different materials. Plywood is a big one, but a lot of sheet plastics um, and iron materials that 
come from the factory in big sheets and to be uh, useful, they'll need to be cut down and people will sell you those sheets, which are already cut down oh my and they will charge you two times, three times as much for that because they cut it down. They made it easier to carry um, to put in your car, which might be super useful. So if you have a small car, that can be useful, but being able to go to Lowe's, wait around for an hour until somebody comes over and cuts the sheet in half for you so you can bring it home is a really useful thing. But having this at Makehaven um, does allow you to get the big sheet. And if you have a way to get it here, you will be able to save yourself potentially a fair bit of money. Um, yeah working with a lot of different materials that come in sheets. I've also seen conversations on Slack of like somebody needs to pick up like a sheet, but they only need half sheets of a message. Like does anybody want to go, you know, send it on a split this with me. And so let's see. You know, Another so aspect of having a community like this. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, the big that whiteboard panel right there. Fifteen dollars at Lowe's or Home Depot. If you buy a project panel that's two feet by two feet, which is one eighth of that, it's also fifteen dollars. Mm -hmm. So if you just buy the big sheet and come in here and cut it up, you get eight of them for the same price as one of them. Yeah. In fact, that and that are the exact same thing. Just this is on a frame, and that's probably like two hundred dollars. And that's yeah, fifteen dollars at Lowe's. Yep. Or what? It was donated. In case you're curious. Oh, there you go. There you go. Uh, all right, the drill press. Um, do you want to let's let's hear it? What do you got about the drill press? Um, it presses a drill. <laughs> so it drills. I am guessing are all tools. Probably most people have used a drill at some point, um, even if they have used no other tools of any kind. Um, drills are super handy when you are drilling holes. It can often be difficult to get a hole that is perfectly perpendicular to the surface of your material. Um, so you have a board. If you're going to install, I don't know, a hinge at the edge of a cabinet, if you're going to uh, add a decorative adornment, you're going to put a wine bottle in it. Yes. Yeah. That could yeah. need a hole that is perfectly square and 90 degrees um, relative to the surface of that board. And the drill press will be your friend. It can also do any other angle you want to have a hole at, depending on what you're doing. Um, but 90 degrees is most common. What's um, really nice are these big handles over here on the right. It turns like a ship steering mechanism or like a uh, steering wheel, just turns around. And so you're not like, directly manipulating it, you're pretty removed from where the cutting is happening. So you're able to do that really safely. Um, and it's really straight. It works really well. Does the platform turn to do that that diagonal cut mm -hmm. for the... It does. Yeah, so you can loosen it and you can get, as I said, any angle you want. And then it's, because we're in a shared workshop, it's really polite and almost necessary. Please put it back to square when you're done. Um, because if it if you wanted to get a 92 degree cut, a 92 degree hole, and then you leave it like that, then everybody else is going to get 92 degree holes. Yeah. So please, if you're going to take it out of square, put it back to square. And if you're hyper nervous, check for square before you make your drill. Does it have uh, like a degree measure built in? It does. It's hard to find. It is kind of hard to find, okay. and it's not something I would super trust all the time. So. Um, there's tricks we can try yeah. ways there are other tools that will help you find angles yes yeah mm. okay keeping keeping the things moving forward the wood light um this is jazz woodworking is my that's how i like to think about it um where you're making it up as you go and things can change on the fly and that's not a problem uh it sounds like that shouldn't be true because you're spinning a piece of wood uh like we just did the drill press where your tool spins into a stationary piece of wood this is sort of the spiritual reverse of that. Your tool is basically stationary. You're holding it still and the wood spins into the tool. So it's spinning things along this axis down the middle. 
and it's real it's really fun to do there's people definitely find this satisfying online there's a lot of woodworking videos of just the lathe um it's it's the the pottery throwing of woodwork right? yeah yep yep it's yep very artistic very in the moment yeah is it one speed no we've got a variable speed drive on this one and so you can dial it into different speeds your different yep. precision yeah, and if the piece is really big, you want to dial down the speed for fun physics reasons because you're further from the middle. When you get close to the middle, it's only moving around a little bit. If you have a, a 10 inch wide piece going around just a little bit, 10 inches wide, it's flying past you. So you want to change and adjust settings on the lathe. Um, but often I find that like you can sort of feel if it's wrong. And so you'll know like this is spinning too fast. I don't want to touch it. Um, can, you use, can you use green wood in, in when you do that? Like, because wouldn't it be softer to turn, right? Or yeah. So I said earlier, wood uh, that you're doing woodworking with normally you want it to be dry. Yeah. You want it to be at the same uh, humidity, the same moisture content as it's going to have just sitting in a room. Um, the wood lathe. Turning is a great example of a time when it's actually better a lot of times to use green wood because it'll cut more easily. And you can just, you see a tree by the side of the road that they cut down and cut into rounds. You can take it home, split it in half, and make a bowl. And that is, and it'll dry once you have turned it, it'll dry a lot more quickly and be. So you can wait over to your Christmas tree. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah. Christmas tree use. Yeah. Uh, another, if if um, the router table is also great, uh, trying in my head to be oriented of which are the most important of these tools. If the table saw is one center of a wood shop, that's for all of the straight cuts. Um, the router table is sort of it's analogous in that it's sort of there's a big central spinny bit uh, in the tool that's a little dangerous. This is sort of a cousin to the table saw, but it does a very different job. It has these tools like this. These are all different router end mills, router uh, router bits, where you can get different shapes. They stick up out of the center, and then you pass a piece of wood over it to get weird edges on them. So all the like trim that you've ever seen that has weird profiles, it was probably cut in some monstrous factory uh, with a router somewhere in that pipeline. And so these happen, a lot of the faces that you're really familiar with, they often come from like this OG bit is a curve that you would 100% recognize on someone's kitchen cabinets. Um, absolutely. And there's other ones that come in different ways, a cove bit, the round over, those are, these are all famous ways that you use a, a router bit to make those shapes. And there's hundreds of router bits. You use that in picture framing too? Yes, if you want to take a, yeah. An OG on the end of your picture frame will give it a, a classical look. Yeah, there's there's ton, and you can use multiple of these. You can steer them together. Some of them, like this raised panel bit, has a bearing on the end, so like this will ride right on the edge, so you always get a consistent look. So some of them have different features. There's a lot to unpack. Router bits like this can often be twenty bucks a pop. So like because some of the some of the usefulness of the tool is baked into the bit that you're buying. And that's great. Um, however, they do wear out over time. Like it's a consumable part. So like on a table saw, you might need to replace the saw blade every so often that we have enough here that you don't need to. But if you want a real specific shape out of a router table, you might need to buy a router bit. Um, last year, a person in foundations bought a router bit because they wanted a perfectly round cut that went down into a cutting board. They're making a juice groove, like a well and free juice groove. And so they bought a really specific type of bit to make that happen. Um, so sometimes you need to get real specific, but a lot of the time there's things that you can do that are really helpful with just basic ones. And we have a whole collection downstairs. We have choose your own adventure router bits. And as with pretty much anything in the wood shop, we probably have ones if you need something specific or you need something that you know is sharp and will do exactly what it's supposed to do. You could probably bring your own. Um, in my bag, I carry my own router bits. I've got, uh, let's see, in here I've got a set of 
eighth inch, and here's my quarter inch down cut bit, and then here's a bunch of other ones of varied sizes. So that there's a whole yeah, absolutely. This is one that I back to Darcy that I've let Darcy use. This is a V bit so that I can get pointy things out of a out of the router table or out of a CNC machine. And so there's various reasons why you might use different bits, but I, I totally carry these around with me. Always. Oh, there you go. Yeah. You got one too. Um, another thing with this is you always want to feed from right to left. If you feel like breaking that rule, you should know why you're going to break that rule. You want to push into the blade. So it should be spinning against you. If you instead fed from the other direction, the other way from how that arrow is pointed to the right, there's a chance that that router bit could grab it and pull it away from you. So by pushing it into the blade, you're sort of fighting against it, which is good. It's very controllable. If it goes the other way, you're sort of like pulling on the leash of a large dog trying to keep it with you. Um, if you're doing it this way, you're, you're pushing something up a hill. And while that can be tricky and hard to do, it's more controlled than like something that's trying to run away from you. Um, so, and there's definitely like, this is an arrow that's permanently affixed to the router table. So you don't forget, check that sticker if you need to remember. And with the router table, it is, are, we're going to cover routers next. It is a router upside down with hand routers. It's all exactly the opposite because it's spinning the opposite direction. Yep. Relative to you. Okay. Hand tools. We just went over a lot of power tools. And these are, there's, well, I think we just did names because there's so, so many. Um, but there's uh, dovetail saws, crosscut saws, bench planes like these. See, I don't know where this link goes. Oh, yeah, it goes to make even things. This is a bench plane. This is the old style. Instead of the planer, this is how they used to do it by hand. So there's a sharp knife in here and little wood curls come out of there. They're very pretty. People really like to use these because they just look beautiful. Um, but it's a lot of work to do the same thing that a planer does. Um, here, but here's other like a shoulder chisel where you can get a, there's a little blade in there if you need to get right up to the edge of something. There's a low angle block plane. There's hand tools in general. This is a badge where they go over some of those things um, or just equipment in general. There's a bunch of different types of measuring tools that you might use. This is if you want to get curves or a speed square. This is a tri square. These will let you know that things are 90 degrees. This one's fun. It lets you check for metal in your pieces before you put it into anything. Very important. Very important to do, uh, especially for the saw stop that will just like fire if it hits a piece of metal um, on the table saw. So there's lots of examples of tools like these. If you're, you know, if you haven't ever, here's the, the nice tri square. It's got enough that it's its own picture. But um, if you ever are wondering, like, how do I do this or what's going on? There's there's tons of examples. There's a cabinet in the corner. This open as a picture. Yeah, there's a cabinet in the corner like this where there's the fine woodworking tools. The tool that you want might be in there. There's probably a crappier version also. If you have, if you're unsure what you want to do, um, try the lesser version first. And if you pull something from here, put it back in here. These are often the sharpest, which is great. Um, but that comes with effort. Like people are keeping them actively sharp. And they're the kind of thing that if you don't want to accidentally I had a crap chisel for when I was doing housework where I might accidentally hit a nail these should never go in a scenario where you're going to accidentally hit a nail it's it's sort of like um these these stay nice because they only ever cut wood and you you the fine woodworking tools you want to keep that way by only ever cutting wood with them they're their own badge right yeah, yeah they are so the fine woodworking hand tools badge requires the Tormac knife sharpening badge so we have a sharpener which, as Corey said, will keep the tools very nice and sharp. And you need to know how to keep them nice and sharp to use them. Um, so actually, how they stay nice and sharp. And they're safer when they're sharp, which is sort of paradoxical yeah. because they behave how you expect them to behave. If they're dull, then you might have to force it to make them go. And that's when you're likely to slip and things and you cut, um, cut yourself or cut something the way you didn't want to. If they're really sharp, they're buttery smooth and it's really nice. Um, so thinking about that is an important piece. Another thing, because we've got a picture up, this is a standard Western push saw. So this is like a normal, like, ha, 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 the saw that you're used to, where you can really jam on it in both directions. This is a Japanese style pole saw. We saw that Japanese are really good at woodworking before. This is a special type of saw that really only does the cut on the pole. The saw, every saw has a cable to push saw and you push to make it cut. 
I had saws off on a push. Pull saw is in other direction, which is useful because metal is really good in tension. And so it only cuts on the pull and it means you can get nicer, higher quality woodwork. A really good woodworker will transition from a push saw. This would be for like sawmill sorts of rough cut things. This is if you want to cut your own dovetails, you're going to use one of these. But they're finicky. You can't like muscle them. They have to do what they want to do. You're sort of guiding them to make the cut you want. It's a different interaction with a saw than you might be used to. Okay, back to slides. And this. Uh, pneumatic tools, air tools. I love a nail gun. It's unreasonably satisfying. Everybody loves a nail gun. You get like a hearty whenever they fire. Um, the, the, that you hear at a racetrack, that's a pneumatic uh, wrench. All of those pneumatic tools, we have air run throughout the whole shop and air nailers like this, they, they work great. They have these fittings that come in and out. They're a lot of fun. There's a brad nailer. If you stick a metal brad into things, this is what it looks like. Those are nails that are so tiny, you won't see them once they're in. They're super small. They're really helpful for putting together trim, small things. They're really great. Um, staplers, other tools, finish nailer. There's, they're all live sort of on a pegboard like this, let's say. And electric hand tools, there, there's lots of, here's a jigsaw. The jigsaw is that scroll saw, but mobile, right? So this is, this is a jigsaw. There's a impact driver. These are different types of drills. So there's, this is a normal drill and this is an impact driver. This is more for like, when you want to drive in a screw without necessarily having drilled a hole for it before, which is often not good in woodworking, but great in construction, it's really good for that. It adds sort of a, a hammering forward action as it does the spinning. It's really hard to perceive. Here's the a big router. So this is the router table minus the table, and it's all upside down. So the router table, the spinny, dangerous bit was pointed up at you. Here it's pointed down away from you, and all the rules are then backwards because it's upside down. Um, but it's really, really helpful. And if you have a large, you want to apply some trim to the edge of the router bit, you can totally do it with one of these. Um, a lot of these electric hand tools, we went through the sort of stationary, bigger version. Um, but here's here's one that we didn't, a biscuit joiner like this. Oh, I should add the domino. Um, this lets you make little cuts into the side of things so that you can add in alignment pieces. So if you have a lot of big pieces of wood, you want to get them all lined up you can do that. Uh, the, the finishing sanders, sanders like these, these are going to be a thing that you spend a lot of quality time with as you make woodworking projects. The last step to get it buttery smooth on the surface is to sand things down. And so sanding with one of these is good. You want to go through a progression of different sandpaper grits, um, which I don't know if they're on this slide set or next week's, but you start off with the, lo the lowest number grit and you work your way to higher and higher numbers. Those start with rough sanding and then you get more and more fine as you go up. Woodworking projects, often I don't go lower than 100 for my sandpaper grits. And then I usually stop sanding most things at two, two something or three something. Like 100 grit, 120, 220, and 320 are usually the numbers that I can find for sandpaper. If you want to go super glassy finish, a thousand is like out of this world fine for woodworking. Uh, it'll feel like a piece of glass if you sand to a thousand. So it's it's really interesting how sandpaper works. If you want to nerd out on that, I'm always in. Uh, I, I will say that um, the, if you're going to put a finish, like a polyurethane varnish, or even just an oil finish on the feet that you're making, um, that is what will determine the final texture. So sanding to a thousand and then putting a coat of polyurethane over it, it's the polyurethane that's going to actually give you the final texture. So you really only need to sand to like 220. Yeah, um, a thousand was a bad choice. I mean, <laughs> actually, though, if you are doing a project on the lathe, mm -hmm. a lot of times you will sand to a very high grid and go to really, really um, at a very fast speed. And that'll actually uh, polish the wood because you're spinning really fast with a very high grid. Um, and that will make a more durable finish right off the blades yeah um oh saza i like these these are fun just to cut through things like crazy and the angle grinder this is sort of a 
a tool that can be useful in both places. If you want to dig out a lot of material in weird organic ways, this can be a useful one. Um, but let's keep going. Project ideas. So for this week, we're sort of we're closing in on our time, which is which is good. We're on track. Normally, we're going to have a show and tell for like what happened in the end of the week. We went a little long with class this time. We had introductions to do. You know, the, the meeting, we're, we're not going to ask you to introduce yourself again. Uh, that's, that's always a lot. Um, but we want to talk about project ideas. And hopefully we have some progress on these projects for next week. So we can share successes, failures, weird things, the badges that you've gotten. Um, these are, this is the list that I made. Adam may have different or better suggestions or reinforcing suggestions yeah. for this. I did some research and I will. Uh, those are the best ones I came up with. Yeah. Making a cutting board is a really good starter project. Those are put together with just wood and glue, and that's it. Um, you start off with flat pieces of wood. You go to Lowe's or Home Depot, and you go to the select wood row, the select wood aisle. And you can buy a board of walnut and a board of, uh, of I would buy walnut and um, maple. If you get those two woods, you can make a really nice cutting board. Walnut is the dark, is this one that's dark. And then maple is maybe this one. Yeah, maple. Yeah. And then another good one is a cherry, and that's cherry. So <laughs> you buy those three, you can have three colors to make a cutting board, and that's plenty. Um, your family in the Midwest will be very happy with what you made them if that's the case. So you've got that. The lathe is fun. The cutting board does take some planning. It's really, it, it takes some planning to make a cutting board. Uh, the lathe, however, is really nice. It's jazz woodworking because you, you just sort of go with it. Whatever happens, happens. I just thought we haven't put it out yet as like a permanent fixture, but um, we have the supplies to use on the big lathe. You could also make pens. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you can make tiny things. I did yeah. see there, there is a mandrel under the lathe right now. Yeah. But... Yeah. Like, we have a guy who does a class. Um, you grabbing a pen? Like, or like that. I don't know why. It's pretty cool, right? And it's like, it was shockingly easy. It would honestly be like a really great first project. And mm -hmm. we have like Glenn, one of the facilitators, just who does the class, and he has a ton of the mm -hmm. like forms. And I know for sure that he would be happy to show you how and give you one of the pieces. <laughs> yeah. Very excited about it. It's awesome. I'm gonna offer my backyard. I need to chop it down anyway, but I have a, a walnut on Ooh. so like four inches. So if anyone wants a piece, you know, send me an email or something. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Idea for the for the lathe. Be nice. Yeah, that's great. Um, you don't have to start with a round piece to go into the lathe. It often is helpful to knock off corners if you want to. It feels but a little aggressive. It feels it feels kind of aggressive, but it's totally fine. Um. Pepper mills, those sorts of things. Bowls are really nice and easy. Ruby, who will be an instructor in a little while, she made a, a planter on the lathe for her first thing. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah a little planter thing. Uh, you, urn in the middle? I, I don't know what that is. It looks kind of like an urn. Like an urn? Yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to. Starts all eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can make a bandsaw box. These are bandsaw boxes up here. This would be a great starter bandsaw box that you could keep or give to somebody. It takes that bandsaw box would take oh, five, five or six cuts. That's it. Like if you're planning it really well, you can be really clever with those and make a nice little box with only a few cuts on a bandsaw. Um, five or six. Yeah. Uh, making a small box like this out of flat things can be really nice. This is held together with glue and, and brad nails, I would bet. And then if you're really feeling tech savvy and you're comfortable with this and you want to try another new skill, I would recommend you try our Shikoko, which is a wood CNC. It's pretty approachable. If you're already good at drawing things and you and you can like make some vector designs and you, you're, you've you got this, you've been nerding out on maker things for a while, the Shikoko is a great CNC to get started with. And it's in the back corner of the wood shop. If you want to not fight in line to get a badge, that's one to learn. But it, it's its own whole side quest. So that, that's a thing. <laughs> Um, let's see. Next steps for all of you would be to watch some badging videos. So take a look at those online. You're going to hear a lot of Lior, who's delightful. Uh, he's the shop manager. He knows how to fix literally anything. 
And he's made all these videos on how to use the tools. You watch the video, you take a quiz. The quiz is going to be like three questions. You do not need to study or make flashcards. Um, it's like, how do you turn it off? What's the safety items? And like, what's the most important thing to pay attention to? Three genuinely easy questions. They are from time to time broken, but just let us know if that happens. Once you watch the video and take the quiz, watch the video at double speed, by the way. Pro tip. Um, watch the videos, take the quizzes, then you're in a pending state. Then you book a time with somebody like Adam, who's a facilitator, who then can do the checkout in person. So that would be a thing that we'll say, like on Saturday is the next upcoming one from nine to 12, there's a person who's here who can give you lots of your woodshop matches. So if you, yeah. You know, That's Glenn. If you want to make a pen, <laughs> sign up for Glenn on She's Saturday. Person. Yeah. He's a delight. Um, Monday, six to nine. Do we know who that is off the top of our heads? That's Mike. Mike. Yep. Mike is the person who does the wood uh, spoon carving class. That's also really great. And he also does a bunch of pottery, apparently. He like, teaches pottery classes at some wow. somewhere else Science. out there. Yeah, we've talked about it a little bit. Cool. Um, Tuesday, there's another person from six to nine. A lot of these are weeknights. Um, weeknights are just often easy for people because it's a you know, convenient time. Uh, but if you want to be here in the, the morning on Thursdays, that's when Adam's office hours are. And so Adam is a woodshop facilitator of ours, and he can get your badges with a familiar face. So those are those are all fun things to do. And in general, we're going to try and say what's going on these times. If you realize like, hey, I want to do this, you just put a shout out onto the Slack Foundations channel and let me pull up the foundations, the Slack thing that I have. So that's every week. Yeah. Yeah. Every week, those people. What did you say? Uh, noon on Thursday. This, oh, this one, right? Well, yep. Okay. Um, inside of Slack, which we haven't pointed out too much yet. This is Slack. I am in dark mode because I, I like this. Um, but in here, you can follow all sorts of channels and things. I'm going to put all of your names up here in my starred. So if you message me, I get a notification. And these are a few people that are still left in mine. And then down here, you'll get updates on things like down here at the bottom. Here's woodworking. There you can see sort of what's been going on recently in woodworking. Uh, like this is a cool one. Oh, this is a, yeah, this is a neat. Yeah, that's a fun one. Just trying to figure out how those work. Yeah, this is a brand new one. Max is very observant. This is, I think they sandblast the wood. I would guess they had this mask. Yeah, they mask what they want to keep and then they sandblast away. What's left is those high ridges are the parts of the tree that grow closer to the winter because they're a little more dense, a little more fibrous, and aren't seeding away as easily. Crazy? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, Slack channel. If I haven't, I mean, you can, just, you can add yourself or you can message me and add it. If I miss somebody, it's just. It's unintentional. Yeah, but in here, just throw yourself in. The foundations channel is where if you want to talk to the whole group, and please feel free. It's a lot more fun if we talk to the whole group um, so that we've got everybody all together. And so this way you can send out a message. You say, I'm going on Thursday. Anybody want to join with me? We can hang out and all learn the router table together. Or we could get uh, bubble tea on the way in or something, you know, whatever you feel like doing. Uh, those are all, that's a great way to communicate with people and lots of fun. And then choose, put something in your head for a project you'd like to achieve. We have sort of these two weeks together. And then in week three, we'll be talking about the metal shop, but our show and tell will still be about wood shop stuff. So that puts you at uh, 336 hours from, 335 hours from now, we're gonna talk about the cool thing you finished in the wood shop. 